Hey everybody, I just want to remind you that we have an incredible webinar coming up very shortly, depending on when you listen to or watch this. Tuesday, January 26th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we begin a three-week webinar called Talkin' Shit, The History of Hip-Hop, taught by the great Kamasi Hill. Many of you know him from our last webinar called Talkin' Shit, The History of African American Culture, which was extremely popular and Many people demanded that Kamasi teach again, so he's doing it for us. This course will be completely amazing. He's going to take you from the history of hip-hop and its origins in the South Bronx all the way to its present form as the dominant form of popular culture around the world. Go to renegadeuniversity.com. You'll see it on the front page under video courses. Go there, check it out, and I hope to see you. I will be a student, by the way. And so will Hotep Jesus. We will both be students in Kamasi's course. Talking shit, the history of hip hop. Go to renegadeuniversity.com and sign up now. Hope to see you there. Thank you. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Higher education is over. Capitalism is over. And politics is over. And, my guest this week says, they are being replaced by much better ways to learn, better ways to create wealth, and better ways to organize multiple societies. This is my interview with the historian and philosopher, Alexander Bard. I am joined all the way from Stockholm, Sweden, by a man who is very famous, not just in Sweden, but across Europe for many reasons. But I think a lot of my audience will not know because he's not that well known in the United States for some terrible reason. I don't know what that is. We can talk about that. And I'm here to change that. We're here to change that today, Alexander. This is Alexander Bard, who has had quite a life, quite a career, multiple careers, and is now known across Europe as, I think, one of the leading public intellectuals and really a philosopher who is widely read as the author of how many books is it now? Uh, we're working on our sixth book at the moment. I co-write my book with a guy called John Sedeckist. So we, we do philosophy, media theory, futurology, shit like that. And you, and you write so much that you write books in trilogies. You don't think of them as one book. You, you write trilogies of books, right? Yeah. So the first three books are called the Futurica Trilogy. And the second trilogy we're working on at the moment is, is going to be called the Grand Narrative Trilogy. So, yes, yeah. they are. And your ideas are uh, astonishing in their breadth, in their depth. You know about history, you know about philosophy, and you have a whole host of original ideas about the problems of our society as you perceive them, and you also propose many solutions. It's uh, quite a body of work, Alexander, I'm gonna tell you right now, before we begin. Now, the most important thing though, is now that I've established how amazing you are, the most important thing for people to understand is you describe yourself as the Thaddeus Russell of Europe. (laughs) <laughs> that wasn't my idea, you know. Besides once being called Camille Paglia with a penis, which was <laughs> the most honorable thing that anybody ever said to me. Mm-hmm. Yes, I was called the Thaddeus Russell of Europe. Mm-hmm. I think 
it not only has to do with the fact that we work in similar areas and, and, and we're these, you know, sort of dirty old men on YouTube, you know, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's more like, I think that we have a heart in a very special place that we share. Okay. Uh, we sort of godfather. So what I call the shamanic and the, and the androgynous casts, like, right. so I work a lot in my, with archetypes in my work with John and, um, we talk about shamanoid people or shamanic people with those personality traits. Right. And you obviously you've written, you know, about the renegade history of the United States, which ties in very well with this kind of work that I do with Jan Sedekas. So it's not too far fetched actually for people to compare you and me. Right. Besides beards and red hair, but yeah. Exactly. Sorry, I have to fix one thing here. I'll be right back, everyone. Okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, I I uh I find that to be a tremendous compliment and I'm flattered by it, but I am not entirely convinced of it. <laughs> so we will have to get into that. That's one of the things I want to, I mean, we're going to have some differences, Alexander, and that's fine. We'll still love each other. Uh, but so you, uh, well, I'm going to give a sort of a brief summary, I guess, if that's possible of sort of your diagnosis of the problems in our society and I suppose it's mostly Western society. Uh, and then a, a brief, you know, layout sort of how you see the, what we can do or what, maybe it's not even a matter of choice. In some ways, your ideas are teleological. I mean, you seem to think that there's a, this progression that's maybe happening apart from human agency. But let's, let's do a capsule summary of Alexander Bard's chief philosophy. And then I want to go back to your damn childhood. OK, and I want to and I want to do <laughs> I want to I want to do the life, you know, and this is what we do on Unregistered. We um, we don't treat people's ideas in a vacuum as if it was apart from who they are. Uh, we treat the treat it all. You're a monist, right? It's all one thing. So I, I believe these things are all one. I believe that what happened to you when you were three years old has something to do with how you think now. Can we just do that? Can you uh, can you. Uh, oh, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Me? Yeah. Great. So you were born in Sweden. <laughs> I wasn't actually, but it doesn't oh. matter. I, I come from a mixed South African Swedish background. Ah, um, okay. And I think that's good. I think it's great to be bicultural. And I think anybody who has to experience that you speak several languages already when you're a kid and you've lived in several different countries is actually beneficial today because the more you can manage to move around, the more you're an anywhere person rather than a somewhere person, uh, the easier it is for you to navigate in the kind of society we live in today. And actually one of the terms that Jan Sedekvist and I invented early on over 20 years ago was the term global nomad, which is sort of stuck with a lot of people. So uh, yeah, I, I was trained to be global nomad. My, my parents and I, we, we were five kids. Uh, we were trained to travel and, and not to take any values and we traveled for granted, but try to find out for, for ourselves how the world actually operated. So. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that, that, that influenced me a lot. Certainly did. Yes. Why was your family traveling so much? Who were they? What's your class background, sir? Uh, exactly. Well, growing up in Scandinavia, this is probably the one place in the world where class background plays the smallest role, it, it, if it matters at all. Right. Uh, it's like everybody is, is a petit bourgeois, nouveau riche or something like that mm. in Scandinavia. Mm. Uh, but uh, for my family, we came here. This was, of course, compared to South Africa when I grew up. This was in the 1960s. South Africa was going into hardcore apartheid at the time. And I had a black brother in the family. It wasn't like we were going to live there at all. The mm. question was rather, were we going to grow up in the UK or Switzerland? And we ended up in Scandinavia because it turned out to be most opening and free in many ways. And I had a Swedish mom and, uh -huh. and uh, it made total sense. So I, I don't remember going to that many places when I was a kid, but I started traveling early. I went to the United States for the first time on my own when I was 17 to go to college, you know? And my dad gave me a ticket and said, this is a one way ticket to the States. Why don't you go over there for a while? And if you, if you want to go back here to Europe again, then you figure that out. Hmm. So that kind of training to be that independent and to take care of yourself was something I was trained to do at an early age. And I think that really paid off. And why did they travel so much? They just loved traveling. They loved culture. They loved different cultures. They loved comparative studies between different cultures. I mean, I, I, you know, hitchhiked through North Africa when I was 20 and people mm. asked me afterwards, didn't you expect to be robbed and raped? And I said, well, that was part of the plan. So it's just like, <laughs> was I ever afraid? No, I was never scared of anything because I, I think I figured out early on how people actually operate. 
Huh. And, and, you know, hanging out with the drunks and hanging out with the prostitutes or whatever I did the rest of my life was something I did in early age. It didn't matter. I, I could go to one of these dinners with really posh people with a really flashy background or, you know, families of heritage. But I could the next day I could go into a bar and just hang out with the working class lads. And I was fostered that way. My parents were adamant. They didn't want their kids to be stuck in any specific class structure or to be expected to do certain things in their lives. And the great thing was out of five kids in, in our family, we all went in totally different directions. Every one of us, we became oh, yeah. very different. That's why we hang out so much these days and actually enjoy each other's company. Huh. So you, you know, class is cultural as much as economic. In fact, it might be only cultural in my view. And it sounds like you were non-bourgeois from the beginning. Is that right? I, I wouldn't say so necessarily. I'd say if you say that you're classless, it means that you probably pick up traits from different classes. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a question of being able to hang out in different worlds. And you and I, for example, we, we're sort of defenders of the gay world, for example, as straight guys who are like the gay guy's best friends, right? right. And the great thing with the gay world when I started going to gay clubs in the late 1970s, and of course I, I, I cruised on the fag hags, you know, but <laughs> was the fact that the gay guys did go out with a specific uniform with like a white t-shirt and blue jeans to not show class. So they could expect to go home with a guy to an upper class on one night. And then the next night they'd go home to a working class guy. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this is how they got the sort of wide understanding of society that made them into great cultural icons and so they could be playwrights and artists and things like that because all these things that I call shamanics so you say artistic professions like for example you cannot be an expert at any of those things unless you completely remove yourself from these sort of boxes that classes are you have to get out of these cultural classes mm. and be able to move freely in between them but to do that you need social coding you need to understand the codes in the environments where you operate mm. and you need a lot of self-confidence and some audacity but once you got that, and if you have that before you're 20, you got it for the rest of your life. And I think that's your strength in your work. And I try to keep it the same way too. Uh, would this be called cosmopolitanism? Yes. <laughs> Incredibly valuable today because people are essentially born only to stick with their own tribe. This is also part of the work we do. Uh, I don't expect people to be able to understand or love or res show respect towards anybody outside of a group of about 150 people. Mm -hmm. And if you want to so sort of embrace tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of people during your lifetime, you have to take on a very cosmopolitan attitude. And that's something that has to be fostered. It yeah. doesn't arrive automatically. Yeah, and I've heard you talk about cosmopolitanism uh, in regards to the Palestinians, but we'll get back to that in a second, maybe, <laughs> if we have time. Um, so your, I'll ask you a very American question. What did your parents do? You know what Americans mean by that? Yeah, my father studied farming. It's called agronomics or something like that. So it was like large scale farming was his thing. And then he became an entrepreneur. And then after that, he, he just built stuff. You know, he would build house after house after house all the time. That was his thing. Huh. And uh, my mother studied to become a doctor, and, but she became a teacher eventually. And um, then she took up flowers. <laughs> and, you know, when she would go back to South Africa in the 1990s, like after Nelson Mandela had happened, we could all go back to South Africa. And we all decided in the family to go back to South Africa on our own separate journeys, doing our own thing. Now, I went back for the raves. I went back for the techno raves of the culture of the drugs and all that. And my mother went back for the flowers. She couldn't care less about the people. Oh, oh, the because oh, South Africa is like the garden of the planet. I mean, most of the garden flowers we have in the United States or in Scandinavia today were originally African. Right. Most people don't know that, but my mother loved that. So that, she was a florist and she worked with flowers. And she's still around. She's a really cool lady, 86 years old, you know, and, and um, I have tons of fun with her still today. Hmm. So your dad was an entrepreneur, your mom was into flowers, and you were into raves. Yeah, I was into adventure, let's put it that way. So, yeah. But those things, you know, those go together, actually, you know. Yeah, I, but I, I would go off and stay in monasteries. Oh. I, mean, I, I love religion. I love philosophy. And the best way to study is actually to live in a monastery. So I'd go off to Asia and stay in a monastery for months or Southeast Europe or Africa or somewhere. And, and uh, I would just stay with people for months to learn their culture. Huh. At an early yeah. age. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. 
So how do you explain you? I mean, how many siblings do you have again? We are five kids. Five kids. And you said they're all different. Each yeah. Other. And so how do you yeah. explain, how do you explain yourself? How do you explain why you, why you had that very unusual attitude and audacity? I don't think I am different, except I think I was trained from an early age to think in larger circles. Okay. So instead of thinking that this is the sort of world you're comfortable with, and here's a membrane around that world, and don't let anybody inside of it because that will be costly for you. I had more of an attitude that, no, this circle can be much wider. I can live with a much larger sphere. Yeah, you do take risks when you do that. So you run into trouble, right? But it turns out that, you know, you learn how to handle a robbery. And after you've done it seven times, you've been robbed seven times, you know exactly how to behave. So the robber knows you're a professional robbie. So you know exactly how to behave. So they're like, uh, I don't want to get killed and you don't want to kill me. So I'll do what you like. And please hurry up because if a cop comes around the corner, then everything turns to my favor. That's the rules of the game and they get it. So you, you learn that these things are universal. It doesn't matter if you get robbed in Sao Paulo, if you get robbed in Cairo, if you get robbed in Stockholm for that matter, you learn how these things work and you discover that it's really universal. And that was something that fascinated me early on. Yeah. I would be like 20 years old. I was in New York when I was 20 years old, decided not to become an American. That's exactly why I didn't stay in America. I wanted to live in Europe, but then travel the world. So I moved to Amsterdam and start, set, up, set up a business in Amsterdam when I was 20. And from there, I could travel just about everywhere. But what I was really interested in was how similar cultures actually are. Mm. And that's how I became a philosopher eventually, is that, oh, wait a second. Actually, there are a lot of similarities. Basically, humanity only split up about some 40,000 years ago. And before then, for millions of years, we were all the same. And the only reason we split up was because there was a whole world to conquer, essentially. And we still behave the same way. So, for example, when I've done anthropology, I've been working in Greenland or northern Canada for a few months. And then I've been working in the jungles of Brazil for a few months or New, New Guinea. And what I found out everywhere I go is that it doesn't matter if I'm in the tropics or the Arctics people behave the same way. As soon as there's a large population of people, they behave in exactly the same way, which for a philosopher is fantastic because mm. then you could say a lot of things about humans that are timeless qualities in the sense that they're all the same for everybody. Mm. And then you can focus on what changes over time, which I would say is technology. So it sounds like you're a humanist then, this belief that there's shared traits, shared characteristics across the planet, across time among human beings, yes? Yeah, humanist in the old Renaissance sense of being a humanist, but I think so are you. But I'm not a humanist, ideologically speaking, because at the end of the day, sometimes people can be so damn stupid you know, that, that a machine is probably going to be more intelligent in 50 years' time. And I'm not sure I'm going to side with the humans when the machines come along that can think for themselves. Oh, yeah, I don't mean, I don't mean, I, I don't mean. I want to hang out with the cool guys. I think we all do, but I'm not sure the cool guys are necessarily going to be human 100 years from now. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. Humanism is not the normative uh, version of it, but the just the descriptive Part, you know, the belief again, the belief that human beings all all are essentially the same as that, as you've been saying, right? That we all share. Yeah. So the, the, what's called Renaissance humanism over here in Europe, which is a good term for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we already have a first disagreement, but maybe we can get into that later. Uh, and I might be wrong, by the way. You know, I, I I don't know. I haven't I haven't really studied much. I only know a little bit about the world. As much as I've studied, as we know, right? I still am deeply ignorant, profoundly ignorant about more than ninety nine percent of the world. So. Well, I think we all are, but you're a generalist and not a specialist in that case. And that's not a bad place to be at all these days because generalist is what we're lacking. Well, really quickly, I mean, so the, the anthropologists over here, beginning at Columbia University, Margaret Mead and company, you know, I don't know if you're aware, of, you know, but that their whole argument was against this sort of humanism, right? It was the, the, their cultural relativism also. It was saying that all the, there's all, they, what they went, they went to these islands in the South Pacific and found, you know, very, what they saw were very different cultures, very different ideas about things and very different characteristics, right? About all sorts of things, about who's a woman, who's a man, who should run things, all that. So, um, I mean, yeah, but anthropology was split up early on. Uh, my favorite anthropologists are ob obviously the ones who agree with me because that's where I started studying. They're more guys like Marseille Aliad, for example. That's the tradition Jordan Peterson comes from today as well, mm. and Camille Paglia too. The, the Paglia and Peterson mm. come from the tradition that actually there's a lot of similarities and, and yeah. the things that are different probably have to do with things like topology, 
Like okay. it's different to have a culture in the river valley or mm -hmm. to have a culture in the mountainous area. But if you move a guy from a mountainous area to the river valley, he will behave like a river valley person very quickly. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, we, I think we have a dis disagreement, but that's, that's good. That's productive. That's interesting. Okay, which college did you go to in the United States, for God's sake? You poor thing. You went to Antioch, right? Yes. Yeah, that's one side of Ohio. I went to Oberlin. I, that's right. I remember that. You went to Oberlin College. So we went to like the most woke colleges you could ever find in, the, in North America, right? Yes, indeed. And you were there maybe at the same time I was, at least... When were you in Ohio? This was late 1970s. So Oberlin oh. at the time was very woke. You had to be bisexual and a Maoist. Absolutely. To be cool at Oberlin. And if you didn't sleep with both genders and you didn't read Mao's Little Red Book, you were out. Yeah. And back then, Woody Allen was politically correct. Right. So you watch Woody Allen movies and Ingmar Bergman movies all day long, but you must not watch Star Wars or Alien or anything like that. That was that was the value system at Oberlin 1978. Yeah, the value system at Antioch, which I started in 1983, just after you were there. It's amazing. We almost overlapped in Ohio, of all places, um, was that you had to be bisexual and an anarchist, but an anarcho-communist, of course. Right. Yeah, because Mao was kind of over by 1983. So, yeah, yeah. They were, they were, they were inventing new forms of totalitarianism. Uh, there were, you know, grassroots, grassroots, yeah. grassroots totalitarianism, totalitarianism from the bottom up is really what it was. Yeah, the, it's a college, fa it's a college fashion in North America. I discovered that when I went to Oberlin. Yes, indeed. Okay, that's fascinating. Okay, so I started using CBD three years ago, and for quite a while, I bought it from the only places I could find it, which was from big corporations who have come in and dominated dominated the CBD market ever since it started to expand rapidly about three years ago. Those corporate entities deliver the goods, but they never gave me much of a deal, and I never felt like I was part of anything I cared about. So I was really lucky early last year when Paloma Verde CBD came to me and said they wanted to sponsor Unregistered. I tried their products, I loved their products. And I also love the fact that they are owned by Carlos and Vanessa Abelar, a married couple who live in San Antonio, Texas, who operate the business out of their home. Also, maybe most importantly for all of us, they give us the kinds of deals that the corporate CBD companies never do. We get 25% off every single product in the Paloma Verde CBD store by going to palomaverdestore.com and using the discount code RENEGADE. So 25% off every single product. Then also they put together my three favorite products into what's called the unregistered combo pack, otherwise known as the Thad pack. And that includes my three favorite products. They're gummies and a lot of you know that I am off and out. I just got re-upped by Carlos of Pluma Verity sent me a new order and I'm super happy about this. All delicious fruit flavors, 10 milligrams of CBD in each gummy. The Big Time Medicine is their soft gels, 25 milligrams per soft gel. I take many per day, all depending on what uh, the news is telling me about the world and the catastrophe we are continuing to live through. Anyway, but my favorite thing for anxiety and insomnia is their high potency tincture. I put a few drops under my tongue and I am telling you within a minute or two, I am feeling different and feeling better. You get 33% off the unregistered combo pack, otherwise known as the Thad Pack. Again, by going to palomaverdestore.com and using the discount code RENEGADE. Please do that now. palomaverdestore.com, discount code RENEGADE. Make your body feel better, make your life better, and I thank you. Um, all right, let's, um, let's do, okay, and then music. I mean, you have this whole musical career that's, you're a rock star. You're a rock star in Europe, or at least you were. When did that start? What's the, you haven't even mentioned music yet, but that's obviously a very important part of your life. What's the story there? Tell the story. Well, I, I started with theater. Okay. So I went to theater school in New York. That's why I was after Oberlin. Uh, but I discovered theater was too dusty. <laughs> 
you've been done. Mm -hmm. And I love technology. So I just got into gadgets and, and started elaborating with gadgets and discovered synthesizers and sequencers and things like that. But, but I was more interested in video art and performance art. Hmm. Uh, so I started working as an assistant to video artists and performance artists. And this was easy because I lived in Amsterdam. So I could go from Amsterdam to Berlin, to Paris, to London, to New York. And I traveled a lot. This was early 1980s. Okay. And I started having a career, but it just turned out that a lot of these people who did video art, for example, asked me for soundtracks because they figured out that I'd figured out a way how to make music very quickly and was good at it. So it just turned out that I had talent for it. And I was discovered I, I, I was quickly discovered by a record company. My first band I set up with two, you know, sex workers who were dancing on the stage while I was screaming at the center of it. And it looked really cool. But then a record producer died from a cocaine overdose. And then I learned, okay, that's the way the music industry works. You know, you, you, you got to sort of cover your ass. But I learned quickly how to write pop songs. And hmm. in 1984, I decided I also had to grow up. So I actually um, I went to Stockholm and I enrolled at the Stockholm School of Economics where I've been ever since. So I had an academic career in parallel. But while doing that the next year, one of my songs became the number one song in Sweden because Agneta from ABBA recorded one of my songs. Mm. So I had a big break as a songwriter. And then I was asked to become a record producer. And I did that for the next three or four years. And then I discovered that I could probably do that thing they did on the stage better than those guys did too. And I formed a band called the Army of Lovers. And this band became like a cult band. We sold 7 million records. We toured mm. the world. Uh, in America, we were big with a gay audience because we were very flamboyant and over the top. And you could not play our records on American radio because they were obviously too obnoxious for that. Mm. But they did well in South America and Russia and other places. So we toured the world for several years. It was a very hectic time. Wow. But this was the 1990s for me. And then I, together with my, my partner, Ola Hawkinson, I started a record company called Stockholm Records. And out of Stockholm Records, there was a lot of success stories, like the Cardigans, that was a number one oh, band yeah. in America. Yeah. yeah, we even did something called 18s, which is like we recorded ABBA songs, but we kids singing the ABBA songs, and it sold millions of records in North America, of course. It was a very Disney, right? So we made all kinds of records. Um, I, was, I spent a lot of time in America. I would go regular to New York and Los Angeles to see the record companies, to go to these A&R meetings and set up the careers for the artists that I was managing, essentially. So I both had my own bands, several of them, four in total. And uh, I wrote songs for other artists and produced records and, and worked as an agent and run record companies and music publishing. So wow. I was all over the place in the music industry for, for 25 years, to be honest about it. It was only seven years ago that I decided I wrote the winning song for The Voice, the TV show in China. That year, which I think was a great way to go. It's just like, it was just a song I wrote in 50 minutes and the Chinese loved it. So they thought it sounded like Rihanna or something. I don't know. The Chinese girl sang the song. It was number one in China. And I thought, what an excellent way to quit. Yeah. So I got out seven years ago. So you were creative, entrepreneurial, and nomadic during those years. Yes, that's true. Uh, you know, the, the great thing that I'm so grateful for is that I got to see the world from the inside. Because the great thing if you tour the world is that you see it from a totally different picture than a tourist would, because you're working all the time. Yeah. And you get to see people who work at radio stations, TV stations, media, everybody presents the local stars in that country, you get to know them, you make friends everywhere. And the sort of global network that I created during those years is something that I find incredibly valuable today. I'm more interested in arts and things like that today rather than what's in the charts. But you know, the, the people I got to know then are of course all music industry executives and television industry executives and they work at tech companies and things like that today. So I made friends forever, you know, around the world. And um, I'm incredibly grateful, you know, for the 25 years I could experience in the music industry. And it also it, it taught me several things that I found valuable today. For example, that popularity wasn't that interesting at the end of the day. What was interesting was to be artistically brilliant at what you do. And rather have a smaller audience and, and be uncompromising about your expression rather than try to be number one of the charts all the time. Yeah, uh, but you managed to do both. I mean, you were very popular, had a big audience, but were doing exactly what you wanted to do. Sounds yeah, like so my neighbor was Max Martin. 
And he's obviously the biggest songwriter, record producer ever. He's had more number one records in America than anybody else. You know, it's, it's Katy Perry or whatever it is. He writes the record. A lot of these number one records in America are actually made in Scandinavia. We've had oh. this sort of huge pop industry. Here. But Max Martin loved finding out what the number one song would be like. And he's very good at it. Like he's really good at it. But he loved me because we would collaborate in the studio very often. But I was more the kind of guy who was a bit like you, Thad. I was more like the guy who was more interested in being number 23 in the charts with the subversive record rather than try to be number one with a really damn good pop record, right? right. So I always stayed with that more subversive side of things. And, and some of the bands I work with are more in art museums and things like that today rather than the number one on Spotify because the, the subversive work we did in the 1990s with the artists that I worked with mm -hmm. had a staying power that is closer to art than it is to pop culture, I think. What was subversive about your music? Oh, the themes? Hey, uh, yeah, it's like Army of Lovers had a number one record across Eastern Europe called Sexual Revolution, okay? <laughs> the lyrics go something like, everybody should make love with everybody all of the time, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, okay, so this is the Sexual Revolution. And we would make, uh, you know, uh, music videos where everybody would like snog with everybody else, right? And, and, and of course, this was like a theme song for every dime pride parade you could have in any country in Europe where gay pride meant something. And it's still the most, played song at pride parades in Europe, as far as I'm concerned today. Now, of course, it, it was a club record in America, but you could not play this on American radio. That's why so many of my records were too subversive for, for the American market, and they probably still are, except now, of course, with streaming, um, that has changed altogether. And you described yourself as straight. Yes. Because this sounds very gay, all of this, in the best ways, in the very best ways. The, what you're describing is what I love about gay culture, at least what it used to be. Uh, I mean, ecstatically love gay culture in the ways you're describing, but you're, you're very much a purveyor of it during this time, but you are a straight guy. How do you explain? Yes, I, I think I love camp. And for example, the Army of Lovers, the other guy was, a, was an obviously gay guy called Sean Perbarda. And he was like a star on stage. He still is. We're best friends now. He's just like, he's fantastic. Huh. Um, and Jean Pierre and the girls in the band, they all had big boobs and they were showing their boobs all the time. And they were also funny and quirky. And I didn't care if they could sing or not. I just wanted the charisma. You know, it's, um, that was the idea of that band. Then, of course, I had other bands later. I had the really sort of, weird band called Vacuum that was huge in Italy and Russia in the late 1990s. They're still around, by the way. Hmm. And uh, they were sort of synth rock. So it was just like mm -hmm. Ayn Rand type of lyrics, you know, with like, uh, we, Vacuum had a song called Nuclear India. <laughs> It was a celebration of the Indian nuclear bomb, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I told you I love subversive lyrics. I, I love, I, I, so I think camp, is better than gay when it comes to the kind of aesthetics that I love to work with. Mm -hmm. I love when pop culture goes completely over the top. Gotcha. Okay, so say, this is 2021. So when we look at Netflix and HBO today, I would love Bridgerton. Bridgerton would obviously be gay, right? But I would also love Euphoria. And Euphoria isn't gay at all, but Euphoria has a really strong sort of queer, dark side to it that I would love as well. I think those series, not that I've written them or anything, but they appeal to me, my sensibility enormously. I think they're both fantastic, but in totally different ways. Fascinating. So th this is where we agree very much, or at least we're, we are very similar. I have always been a lover of gay culture as a straight man and have always been. And it's lacking today. I always point oh. out that the reason why fashion has become so boring is because women decided to make their own dresses because <laughs> the gay guys were gone. You know, we, I think something we should really observe here is that we live with the time period from about 1984 until 1992. Mm -hmm. Those were eight years when almost any good looking smart club or gay guy, because they were the ones that had great sex lives, died. Mm -hmm. You know, And I think we live with the consequences of that ever yes. since because yes. they not only did they die and did that's why broadway started to do repeat shows all the time it because was, the talent they should have written broadway musicals were gone right i've been but also yeah. the, the the generation that should have trained smart gay guys today weren't around thank you i've been saying this for a long time i don't think i've heard anyone else say this aids was a holocaust for human beings but it was a holocaust for our culture it was yeah. a cult cultural holocaust. People do not understand what we lost as a society and as a culture from that. All those incredibly talented, brave, and subversive people 
who who made things, who created things, who created art and fashion and film and and everything, and just our aesthetic sense of the world, the way we interact with physical space, came from that whole generation. Most of whom were, many of whom were killed by AIDS. It's uh, yeah, it's underappreciated what what that really meant. Enormously, and and the the, the damage done from a disaster like that lasts for generations because yeah. it's also about who becomes the teacher and the student in the next generation. Because right. the great thing with gay culture was there was the older gay guys who taught the younger gay guys and adopted them and That's probably right. slept with them too, and then trained them to be great script writers and, and directors and all kinds of things. But it's it's picking up. I mean, the, there's obviously a lot of this happening, and the fact that the Netflix and HBO revolution is going on at the moment, we're going to be drenched in all kinds of drama series, but hey, a lot of those really have this sort of gay queer sensibility that we love. Mm. Once they once they get over their marriage fascination and realize how much it sucks, they'll get back to being the good queers of the old. Yeah. Hey, why did gay guys start mimicking straight people? Straight people are boring, you know, <laughs> stay yeah. gay. It was a catastrophe, not quite as bad as AIDS, but you know, culturally it was pretty close. Uh, yeah, but they're getting over it. The divorce rate is extremely high among gays, I'm proud to announce. So, um, okay. And hey, they do all the experiments. They take all the drugs and they find out sexual positions the rest of us haven't figured out yet. Yeah, I'm totally pro-gay, absolutely. 100%, 100%, fantastic. Okay, you think, am I right, that the chief maybe overarching problem with society as you, th as you see it today, and I guess this is again, Western society, but maybe I'm wrong, is what you call the infantilization of people. Uh, is this correct? Is this what you see as the, the chief overarching problem today? Yes, so great. the infantilization starts with permanent settlement. <laughs> to be really honest about it. I mean, what happened was that some 8,000 years ago, a fat lady somewhere around Babylon and Mesopotamia decided to sit down and people joined her because <laughs> mm -hmm. suddenly they could afford to actually live in one of the same place without mm -hmm. being constantly nomadic. We're both fans of nomadism, but yes. people decided to settle. Uh, they started breeding uh, and, and they grew stuff and they, they you know, domesticated animals and plants and, and we got something called civilization because of it. Now, civilization deserves to be treated fairly, but it should also be criticized, I think. And that's what philosophers have tried to do many times over. Uh, there's a second boot then of infantilization that happens around 800 years before Christ. And it's usually celebrated in the history of ideas. It's called the Axial Age. It was, a, it was an era of further prosperity. The Bronze Age had collapsed. I love the Bronze Age because that's when people build stuff. That's when mm. the computer games are located these days. Mm. But during the Axial Age, they stopped building and started talking a lot more. And we know ancient Greece, we know ancient India, we know ancient China from this period. And all these thinkers came along and became pillar saints and boy pharaohs and all kinds of things. But we got a problem with that. And that was that we started separating body and mind. And we've ah. got dualism because ah. of it, with Plato, for example, in Greece. And those are the things that I'm very critical of. And in the new work I'm doing now with Seneca, we're actually going to go all the way back to the Axel Age and basically say that the history of philosophy has declared this period to be a golden age. We think exactly the opposite. We think that most of the problems you have today originate from this period. Now, what happened after 1945, especially in Europe, was that this sort of infantilization of society kicked in for a third time. And this is when it goes really grotesque. Uh, all this is because we killed about a hundred million people, mostly young men yes. in the battlefields of Europe. The Europeans were nasty and terrible because we got two guys called Hitler and Stalin and eventually the Americans arrived on our shores and you know saved us from mm -hmm. the misery we created in Europe. Thank you for doing that, right? You're welcome. You're welcome. So Europe killed a hundred million people. Now, the problem with that is that, of course, this meant that women got a chance to achieve a lot of things. And we got women's slip, we got gay liberation, we got all kinds of fantastic things after 1945. Mm. But I also think you should be honest enough to admit that the problem was that we infantilized culture on a massive scale. And this starts in the 1950s with the celebration of the teenager. Mm. The teenager doesn't know shit, but mm. the teenager is a sexy motherfucker. So we had James Dean and Marilyn Monroe and, you know, even if they killed themselves 
while they were still young. And Elvis Presley ate himself to death when he was jerking off to other people fucking in front of him, bored to death. Like all of these things that happened around Elvis and Marilyn and James should have warned us that maybe we shouldn't have Kurt Cobain as an idol eventually, but we did. Right. So what I'm saying is that the shamanic characters, and the okay. androgynous characters that should be idols if you are shamanic or androgynous. So queer culture for me is something I'm proud of and I love to be part of, but I think it's about 8% of the total population who are queer in different ways, either shamanic or androgynous. Shamanic essentially meaning you're queer, but you're straight. Androgynous meaning you're queer and gay and trans or whatever. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. And I love these categories, but there are only about 8% of any given population. 92% of the population in anywhere you look in the world will be turned out to be regular straight Joes and straight Sally's or whatever. You know, it's just like, so instead, you, how, of, instead of keeping the shamanic queer characters to that population, we started celebrating them as if they were idols for everybody. How did you arrive at 8%? That's a very precise figure. Yeah, data. It's yeah. called data anthropology. It's fun to do. And you basically <laughs> take data from several million people who are stupid enough to leave their LinkedIn, LinkedIn accounts and Google accounts open. And then you start making comparisons, depersonified, I should say, but you, you have gender, you have age, you have other categories you, you use. And then you discover certain behaviors or certain key questions you're looking for. And you immediately see patterns that are similar everywhere in the world. So you can study Chinese people or Canadian Inuits or, you know, average Californians or whatever, you get to the same numbers. And that's exactly why, for example, gay pride and women's lib are becoming truly global movements because the people who fight for their rights turn out to be exactly the same numbers everywhere you go. Of course, women are half the population everywhere you go, but it turns out the gay guys and lesbian women are the same numbers okay. in any population you check, so which it means they're born that way, seriously, right? So tell me again about your definition of shamanic. Why am I a shaman? So shamanic are, okay, if you think of the original tribe that was constantly moving, you had an inner circuit run by the matriarch. The oldest woman would run that. That's her territory. Okay. Mostly women within that group, right? And then you have an outer circuit, mostly men. This is where the warfare and the hunting goes on. It's run by patriarchs. So right. it's run by priest and it's run by a king of some kind, right? right? And you better keep those two guys separate because they have different roles to play. But once this whole thing starts moving, which is called nomadology, it's the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze invented the term. Mm -hmm. Once you get a nomadology going, the king and the priest must lead and the men pull forward and then the women and the inner circuit follow afterwards. Now, once you've got the map in your head, there's an inner circuit called matriarchy, outer circuit called patriarchy. They're equal, by the way, don't worry about that. But you got to have some guys that go in between these two. Oh, wow. That means it's great to have androgynous people around. So you got some lesbians with bazookas who got hunting with the straight guys, and you got some gay guys who fix the hair in a hairdressing salon in the inner circuit. And, and this actually makes a lot of sense for people LGBT because that means their sexual orientation is actually secondary. Who they really are is way more important than just in who, who they sleep with. Mm -hmm. But you also have people who go between, between tribes. Contrary to what some historians like Jared Diamond have claimed in the past that we were a constant warfare with everybody else. Well, when I started studying people in New Guinea, you had these people with weird hairdos and strange costumes who walk straight through the battle nobody would send any arrows their way. They could walk from one tribe to the next. Nobody would touch them. Then when I came to Colombia and I worked in the Colombian jungle with the Shikibo people, then it turns out that in between the tribes, they had a big Moloka, like a temple, where everybody could go from the different tribes to smoke a peace pipe or have a rite of passage or whatever. And the people who lived there were considered shamanic, meaning they did not belong to any of the tribes. They were their own little category. Okay. So in my work, I started calling these people the shamanic caste. The shamans are not androgynous in the sense that the androgynous people are. So they're not necessarily LGBT at all. They probably are more sleeping with each other, you know, with opposite genders, but they're go-betweens between tribes. And if you think of, if you think you live in a tribe and you try to orientate yourself towards the outside world, if a guy who's outside the tribe, but a friend of yours is shamanic and he's a go-between to the other tribes, it also makes sense that he's a vertical go-between meaning he's the guy who talks to the gods on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So this is the beginning of religion. So when you come close to 
going outside, like the original diplomats, not the sort of guys who, you know, work for the U.S. embassies today, but the original diplomats, medicine men, or, you know, priestesses with shamanic witches, brews, all these characters are shamanoid people. And they turn out to be about 4% of the population in any given population that we study doing data analysis. Hmm. So these are, these and, and, and so they're valuable, but the, the thing is we go to these people for guidance when we lose it. So a really good therapist or a psychoanalyst should definitely be shamanic, right? Okay. But, but what happened after 1945 was that the traditional male heroes, the military guys were swept aside, right? And, and the priests and the monks were swept aside and you didn't have any traditional male heroes to look up to if you were a young man. So these shamanic characters were invented as rock stars and television stars and media stars. Andy Warhol did a good job at, you know, fat, being fascinated as sort of a, a, you know, a gay voyeur from Ruthenia or something, wherever he came mm -hmm. from. Andy Warhol just, just exposed this and said, this is 50 minutes of fame for you in this new sort of mass media environment that happened after 1945. But what he meant was that the shamanic characters have taken over the stage. Okay. And I think that set a very dangerous precedence because the way you interpret the shamanic with the very experimental lifestyle they have, that looks like looks playful to you if you don't understand it, although it's actually very serious. So when the shaman is experimenting, it looks like he's playing. So play became the dominant mode of our society. Ah. And then in the 1980s, the internet came along and we were all supposed to create media. And all we did was to go into this incredibly infantilized mode. Mm -hmm. We we're all like kids in a, you know, in a, you know, it's like kids in a crash. It's like, everybody's like a six year old who just plays all the time. And we are supposed to grow up and become adults and take responsibility for ourselves and be committed to relationships we live in and build things that last for a long time. And we're behaving like a bunch of kids. Hmm. Okay, so sh the shamanic are non-tribal, sounds like. Is that right? They're not, they're not limited by the rules and the norms of any given tribe, even the one they're born into. Exactly, they're extra-tribal. Extra or post-tribal yeah. or maybe, yeah, extra tribal. No, extra tribal, they're outside tribe. Yeah. That's outside. what extra means, extra okay. tribal. They're, they're they, outside tribe, they, they go between tribes and they peacefully. Are and they are cosmopolitan in that they travel, they, they, they travel between, among tribes and they are liaisons between tribes as well. They, they right, they, yes. they, they establish a communication link between the tribes perhaps too. Exactly, so when you later build temples and trading posts that okay. become the first cities, the shamanoids are overrepresented in any of those places. Okay. So until modern times, what we call a city would have mostly been populated by shamanic people. And so these are people- Go between, because they, 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 they did well at trading posts. Again, they do anywhere, anywhere where different cultures are peacefully going to communicate with each other, which right. is when you build temples and when you build trading posts. And that's exactly why these eventually, the temples eventually become the capitals of nation states and things, and the trading posts become the harbors of the world where you trade. So shamanic people were out there. They were creating the first cities. That's exactly where you're absolutely right to post, point out that cosmopolitanism starts with them. And here's one of the traits. When you do a psychology survey to find out whether somebody's shamanoid or not, one of the questions you ask them is you just give them a few pictures of people with different skin colors. Mm. And the funny thing is they don't even understand the question. Mm. Like, Why would I care? Yes. They're people. Yeah, but do you remember who had a brown collar or a white collar or blue yes. eyes, green eyes? And they, they yes. can't even remember. They can't. They just Fantastic. like... It, 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 it can't, it can't, if you're shamanoid, you, you don't understand why racism is such a big thing with so many people on either side of the fence. You don't get it. It's just like, it's just the weirdest thing ever. Because racism or just racialism is tribal, right? Yes. There you go. I love it. Okay. They are also, sounds like intellectuals maybe first in that they are really primarily interested in ideas and exploring ideas and they are not limited in their scope by tribal norms. In other words, yes. they, are, they are interested in other people and their ideas uh, maybe equally, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I mean, they do drugs and, and they, they probably sleep with anything that moves. Oh. Um, another trait of shamanic people is that they don't understand sexual orientation. <laughs> Right. Also a tribal yeah. custom. Also a tribal yes. custom. A sexual orientation. Yes. 
because that whole thing with inner circuit, outer circuit makes no sense. Also, if you find that women are incredibly independent and live on their own and do their own thing and sleep around with guys whenever they like to, usually shamanic women. And ah. who do you think are my favorites, by the way? Ah. Who do you think my female lovers are, right? Yeah. Why would I sleep with anything but shamanic women? They're fantastic. Give me some, uh, give me some examples of shamanic women in history or ever, or even now. Oh, they'd be overrepresented in the arts. Okay. That's for sure. And uh, the, the, yeah, female artists. Um, okay. the, mm. Absolutely. The, the, that's where you find them. I think people like Camille Pogler are obsessed with them, writes a lot about these characters throughout history. Okay. And, and, you know, anywhere from Sappho during ancient Greece and forward, you find these characters that are clearly, clearly have these shamanic traits. And if not shamanic androgynous, and very often in between the two. Right. And I would they, say that even even if even if most shamanic people are straight, if we talk station, it's a bit boring. I would say that gay people are still overrepresented in the shamanic category. So, if if this total population is about maximum eight percent of the overall population, I would say if you go to a place like Burning Man, they're more like the vast majority of people who go there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they are also fundamental in a profound way anti-conservative right anti-tradition yeah they take more risks they die they die younger so this whole idea of die young stay pretty is like that could be t-shirt for any person with a shamanoid personality so expect them to take more risks expect them to also be more uh, prone to addiction things but not take addiction as seriously as other people do because the consequences for shamanic people at least mentally are not as bad as they are for other people if you, if you have a friend who, who went into an addiction knowing it and stayed there for a few years and they walked out of it and wrote a book about it, it's probably a shamanic person. Mm. So the, the capacity to go to really dark places and to go to very ecstatic states and visit them and memorize them are very shamanic. So say you live with shamans, for example, which I've done several times over. So you live with the shamans in the jungle and you learn the traditions and you learn which herbs and drugs and things they use and all that. You discover early on that, yeah, you get to do the fun stuff in the beginning, but it comes to a point where they bring you in one day and say, listen, you're ready for the hardcore stuff now and it's gonna be really tough on you. But if you don't experience how horrible life can be, you're not a proper shaman. Hmm. Now you, you gotta understand the whole variety of what life offers you. Right? Now you said the, some bad things about the way the internet's been used. I'm so sorry. Um, that's horrible as a host. Um, the internet, it seems to me, the shaman would be uh, thrilled. This is the best thing to ever happen to the shamanic caste is the, is the advent of the internet because they can travel, the, the tri it is, they can travel among between and between tribes more easily and they can learn from other tribes more easily than ever. Is this correct? Is this, isn't the internet? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, internet, that's absolutely correct. The, internet the problem is though, is that shamans are concerned with other people, not only themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. So the shamanoid people today are like me. They're concerned with the fact that everybody tries to mimic the shamans when they shouldn't. And that's why we have to sort of turn around the whole thing and said, well, we had a radical movement to liberate people who are different. And um, we started finally appreciating difference and plurality in the society. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do so more than ever, hopefully. But the problem is that when people who are not comfortable with that at all, try to think of this like they're supposed to be shamanic when they're not, I think it's just devastating. Hmm. And I think a lot of the problems we have today, for example, with young men who I study all the time, with young men who seek psychiatric care today and are, are blown up when they're 23 years old is because they strive towards a shamanic ideal when they should just be the regular Joe and should be allowed to be the regular Joe. And this is, this I think is devastating. Yes, if you're any kind of minority, the internet has been good news because you finally have your own voice. You can create your own channel. You've done it for academics. I mean, you're already post-academic, ready to get a university that. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. You can do all these things not because of the internet, but then you also discover that, well, wait a second, if the internet was a great way for me to connect with like-minded people around the world and build strong networks with them, which is fantastic, it wasn't meant because I look successful online like other people should use me as the model they should mimic because that can have devastating effects. Yeah, so I want to get back to this um, perversion, I guess you described it, after World War II in the 1950s of making 
shamanic type people our stars the rock stars people like elvis presley james dean etc what i missed that what the problem there was that that was just fun and that led to the infantilization of our culture the the fun part of shamanism rather than the serious what was the serious part that was left okay out? so play and experiment are different categories Experiment is something that grown-ups do and it's dead serious, right? Okay. And play okay. is something that kids do and should do, especially mimicking their parents and, and, and grown-ups so they can be grown-ups one day. Right. And when you look at play and experiment and you don't know what it is, mm -hmm. it can look identical. And the problem is that the experiments that shamans did looked playful to people who didn't understand it. And that became a major problem. Okay, I even think we actually had three world wars in the 20th century. You probably agree with me here because we had the first world war in Europe we had the second world war that involved the whole world and with the third world war called the war on drugs. <laughs> and the war on drugs has killed millions of innocent people around the world, especially in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And it's been driven by the United States government. I have said that word for word, as a matter of fact, Alexander. It is the third world war. Now yeah. that is the perfect example of a shamanic ideal, which is to take drugs, which shamans can do without shame because they can handle it mentally. It's part of the personality type. But when the drugs were then widely distributed by you know fancy hippies in the 1960s and they talked about putting LSD in the drinking water, in the tap water, then of course there was this massive reaction against that. There was like a defense mechanism and the war on drugs was declared naively in the 1970s. They would go after anybody who took any sort of illegal substance, possibly minus alcohol, but anything else was now dangerous. Th these were ghosts that, that just you know, took over people and, and there had to be a mass exorcism throughout all of our cultures to get these substances out of our systems. And this was the new evil, right? Mm. And what happened was of course the opposite. Instead of having a balanced, discussion on which drugs can you take and when in your life and how can you be guided to take those drugs and which drugs should you possibly never take mm. the way you do with medications mm. instead of having that civilized debate we should have had from the 1970s onward popular culture threw, threw itself onto this topic and the, and the drugs became something that was romanticized, popular culture, but politically it was opposed aggressively and billions of dollars were spent on a useless war that killed millions of innocent people and still does. Hmm. The war on drugs still kill far more people than COVID-19 in America every year. It's, it's, it's just, it is devastating. And I think we should honestly say that this sort of slow war, the war on drugs being in the 1970s, should be declared the third world war and the tragedy. We didn't need nuclear bombs to kill each other. Obviously, we have the war on drugs. But to me, the war on drugs should today be discussed in hindsight like, okay, so what, how do we get out of it? And what does it mean to legalize drugs? Not decriminalize, but legalize drugs. So it's under some kind of a construction that makes sense. And this is where you have to actually talk to sh shaman or people and say, okay, so you as shamans, what are you going to use the drugs for? and probably give them a license to do whatever they fuck they want. And if they go and kill themselves with the drugs, then so be it. Because it's what shamans do. And then say to the vast majority of people, so you got teenage kids at home. Okay, not a good thing if they start experimenting with DMT when they're 15 and God knows what else they do the next day and they freak out and end up in psychiatric units where they're 16 with their arms slashed. You know, it's, it's, you don't want that to happen. So how do we scientifically go about the legalization of drugs, because we both have to do it quickly, but also have to do it scientifically. And I think it makes sense here to philosophically lay the groundwork and say, not all people should be treated equal here because some people will need these things, medications. Some people can absolutely take them for all kinds of purposes. And some people should be careful with them and probably do some of these things at certain stages in their lives. Okay. So, okay, so rock stars. So you go to the Shikibo tribes in Colombia, they figured it out. They drink ayahuasca for all kinds of purposes. They don't have the depression pandemics that we have in North America and Europe. You can learn from so many of these cultures today what we don't even know shit about in North America and Europe because we've been so damn arrogant. They walk straight into this trap called the war on drugs. So maybe I missed this, but what is your analysis of why that happened when it did? Why did the war on drugs happen when it did? How does this fit in with your broader analysis of the shamanoid caste and how it was perverted, I guess? There was no priesthood around. Ah. It could have told us what drugs were. 
okay. when the drugs were mass manufactured in the 1950s and thrown into a very commercialized society and became products that created the black market of criminal gangs who traded in North American Europe. And all they wanted was advertising. And the best advertising they could have was spoiled hippie brats coming out of California, going to rock festivals, taking tons of drugs until Charles Manson happened. Okay, so they mimic shamanic behavior, which the vast majority of people should not do. I see. I see. And then, of course, came the backlash. And this was the lack of the other side of phallic leadership. We had no priest who could tell us what was shamanic and what wasn't first in the 1950s. But right. then when you come to the end of the 1960s and the early 1970s, you get the war on drugs with Richard Nixon and everything. And what was that? That was a lack of phallic leadership from the other side. And Richard Nixon starting the war on drugs was, it was terrible at being a proper king because a proper king would have said, okay, we've got the drugs here. We need to put them under state control. We need to make this illegal trade. And then we'd better go and ask some proper shamans out there. What do you need this shit for? And how could we just keep it away from our kids until the kids can grow up and responsibly understand what they're up to? Okay. It didn't happen. There was no king there. There was just a stupid little boy pharaoh called Richard Nixon who started the war on drugs, knowing nothing about it, to make a cheap point that he was anti-hippie. Mm. So too many people wanted to be shamanoid. And is that right? Yeah. And, and So what happens is when you don't have military role models, when you don't have priestly role models, when you don't have royal role models, when you don't have these role models that young men should have, that gap, that negation, that void is filled with shamanism. Mm -hmm. But that's not where shamanism should be. So all I'm saying is, this is what I talk to LGBT people as intellectuals today as well, and the shamanic and the androgynous is, why don't we just try to get the social map correct this time and understand that this map is something we lived in for hundreds of thousands of years. It makes universally sense. We should tolerate everybody because of this, but we should also design society in such a way that we each find our place on the map and then are treated accordingly. Mm -hmm. It's called archetypology. And I think archetypology today is more important than psychology because psychology treats everybody the same way. And I think that's a terrible mistake. And this is why I think archetypology, which is that what kind of man or what kind of woman or what kind of trans person are you? And how can we then put you on the map where you can shine, you know, be your very best? And how can you avoid other people trying to be you when they're not supposed to be you? Okay, so the 92% should be comfortable with their role as the average Joe and not attempt to become shamanoid. Now, yes. okay, but that's now a lot of people will hear that as rank elitism coming from some fancy rock star Swedish philosopher. Who are you to say that they should not even attempt to be non tribal, progressive in the biggest sense people? Who changed My point is that shamanic are not higher. I'm saying this is ah. exactly the problem. You're ah. making shamanoid people a higher category because they have the status. But in any given society in the past, before 1945, it was unheard of that the shamans would have a high rank. Okay. Shamans were not even part of the hierarchy. And the, if you read Rene, Rene Girard, who's a great French American thinker, like you discovered that the scapegoats and, and the witches, you know, that you threw in the fires and things in the past were always shamans. You would always take men or women from the shamanic caste, pull them, you know, their hair into the into the village square, and then you would kill them all they were innocent just to release some social tension in the group. So the shamans were the ones that were always persecuted constantly. But for some strange reason, after 1945, because Phallus died, because we believed Phallus was Hitler and Stalin. Ah. But Hitler and Stalin were fake Phalluses. Mao was a fake Phallus in China. Okay. We haven't seen true phallic leadership possibly since Napoleon in the early 1800s. And the problem with this is that we then were led to believe that phallus is a really bad thing. And this is where feminism was great in the classical version when it celebrated men and just wanted women to move ahead and be good at being strong and feminine. But the sort of distorted feminism we got from the 1990s onwards, the woke feminism that hates men and hates penis and hates anything men stands for is completely delusional, incredibly dangerous. Mm. Yeah, you do a lot of work on gender. So let's, you just, you just uh, laid out a, a lot there that people are gonna be wondering about. So let's, Let's try to unpack this. So phallus, uh, 
what um so yeah lay it out so what's the difference between the matriarchal and the patriarchal as, as you see it and you talk about phallic storytelling versus uh matriarchal storytelling what well, i call it matrical storytelling matrical what's the difference yeah, so you have patriarchal and phallic yeah. matriarchal and matrical okay okay so matrical is in general inner circuit mostly among women right uh phallic is mostly for or among men uh patriarchal just means older men's leadership over younger men. Matriarchy means older women's leadership over younger women. So because the storytelling itself is either matrical or phallic. Um, we have uh, three genital organs that we orientate ourselves through like a slalom where, before we turn one years old. Two of them are on the female body. So we celebrate women here. Mm. They're called the matrix and the mamilla. So mm. we're born out of the matrix, the womb, and we crawl ourselves to the mamilla. That's called birth. But it's really only birth for the mother because it's only the mother who realizes that she and the baby are no different entities. Mm. Because once you start sucking the mamilla, you believe that you and mother are united again and you don't exist. You just, you just, uh, you know, an appendix to her sucking her tit, so you're part of her. So you and mother are one again, and you're, you, you, you don't have to exist on your own, and you're never lonely, whatever. Um, then at about one year of age, both psychologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts all agree that something happens at about one year of age. you got to get away from the miller. And this is called um, the phallic intrusion. So the phallus, you know, being the male genital organ, the only one of interest here, just represents non-mother. Mm. It's always something mother enjoys, uh, but it's not you you either don't have it or you can't have it inside of you. It's not yours at all. It's hers, right? And this creates an enormous envy towards the mother and a fascination with what that is. So phallus represents a journey away from the mamilla. Now, of course, children are not independent. They cannot take care of themselves. So child is this wonderful pendulum between what the mamilla represents, which is where you come from and where you're protected and where you're provided for which your parents are supposed to do. And follows is where you're going towards. And then when you come into your teenage years, what's called the teenage rebellion in popular parlor is in the world of psychoanalysis called the rebellion against the phallus. You turn against the phallus, you turn against the order of your parents. This is when you shit test your parents for a year and discover they're only human, they're not divine. They have all kinds of fallacies and, and, and you wanna be better than them. And then you just realize you can just be different from them and that's fine. And the moment you realize you can be different from your parents, you're ready for the rite of passage and you go into your adult adulthood, right? So that there has to be a rebellion against the phallus for that to happen. The problem with contemporary culture is that the phallic intrusion doesn't happen for most people these days. Hmm. So they stay with the mamilla for years. Mm. Now, if the phallic intrusion doesn't happen when you turn one, it's very, very hard to repair the damage later you're unlikely to ever go through a rebellion against the phallus. So you're gonna have a very complicated relationship towards the adult world for most of the rest of your life. This is what creates mass infantilization in our culture. Okay. So this is an argument that Jan Sertic is arguing in our books. We use Freud, Jung, uh, Lacan, Julia Kristeva, the fantastic female psychoanalyst. They're all yeah. over the work that we do. So we look at both what bright female and male minds have said about this process. And we discover that because the welfare state, anybody gives you money in return for nothing, are essentially feeding you to stay with the tit. So we've created a society that's become dependent on a big tit. And the problem with the big tit is that you never grow up and you never become independent and you never work hard in your life to achieve what you set out to do. And you're going to start hitting yourself sooner or later in your life because you never became a grown up. Mm. Your whole biology turns against you. Mm. So this postponement of adulthood is a serious problem. What we're working towards is what we call an adultification of society. Okay. So to encourage the idea that you should go through adolescence and then you should be a proper adult and go through a rite of passage and then you go through other rites of passages throughout your life. And eventually one day you become a parent and after you've been a parent, you can be a grandparent. And maybe one day when you're older, you're so respecting your community, you become a proper elder. And that's when you really give back to the community before you die. And that whole life cycle has to be, I think we have to return to that life cycle because it is so ingrained in our sociobiology and it's so universal. If we try to fuck it up, we're totally fucked. Mm. But it's scary. 
it's very scary to do that, to become an adult. And much of me wants to be taken care of as a child. I'm exhausted by it. I'm terrified all the time, Alexander. I, I, am, I am ridden by anxiety living in advanced industrial capital or post-industrial capitalism, uh, having to make your own way in the world every day um, in a world that is beset with enemies. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's the way it works. Right. Uh, yeah. But the, the way to handle those things is to be more adult because certain thing, you get certain rewards for being an adult, right? You get yeah. freedom yeah, and, and you get to do what you want and you don't get to do that if you're a kid. True. So, you know, you become independent and those things. And I mean, there are great payoffs and, and you should be so tired of being a child by the time you stop being a child that you want to be a grown. But on the other hand, to be honest about it, at least between you and me, and, and some women have figured this out, is that there are no men out there. There are just boys, but, you know, occasionally a boy can step up to a position where he temporarily looks like a real man. And if he hangs on to that long enough, he's being perceived as a proper man. Yeah, Camille Paglia has talked about um, how men these days wear shorts and t-shirts instead of suits. They don't look like men anymore, right? They wear baseball hats in America. I don't know about, I think in Europe too. Baseball hats and t-shirts and shorts, right? And sneakers, that's what most men wear all the time. Even in, now, even when they go to work, even in business meetings, that's, they often look that way, right? The tech, yeah. the tech people, the tech moguls, they're, they're wearing t-shirts like a boy would. Right. Yeah, they do. And this is also because they're nerds and ner nerds never knew how to dress. They're the opposite of gay guys. So uh, that's one of the problems. But she's right. Pagla is absolutely right. I think there'll be a reaction against it. I think, uh, especially among young women today who have their own problems with eating disorders and the kinds of things. Yeah. They're longing for something that's more cultured and, uh, and they're nostalgic about it. Like, why don't men become men again and women become women again? And, and certainly with sexuality, there's the strong trend within sexuality, which is always ahead of the curve mm -hmm. towards rougher sex and, you know, more adventurous sex that men are men and women are women and whatever. Mm -hmm. And women love that and men love that. And I think that that will continue, but it, it, yes, it will deal with things like how you dress when you go to work or whatever you are supposed to do. It, it will deal with those things too. Certainly right. so. Yeah. We see strong trends in this direction. I think what I'm doing with Jan is basically pointing out the direction we need to go next because the internet itself has been a playground for 20 years, but it doesn't pay off any longer to treat the internet as a playground because we already have a new class society, the digital class society. It's very easy actually to tell if you're gonna be successful or not in this kind of class society. Mm -hmm. If you stay within your echo chamber all day long and only reinforce your prejudices, you're gonna be a loser. Mm -hmm. But if you take on challenges all the time and love to discuss with people who disagree with you to widen your horizons and hear other stories than the ones you've heard before, then you'd be much smarter and you'd be much more successful. We, in our work, we call this difference between a netocracy. The netocrats look for what we call antagony. Antagony means that I love to be antagonic. I love people to challenge me because that makes me smarter. Yes. And people understand that will be very successful, be netocrats, but the people who will just stay within their own echo chamber with people who share their own prejudices and they can run up against the Congress or they can go to Occupy Wall Street or whatever they, they do, but their staying power is nothing because all they do is take a selfie with people who are in their own in tribe. And those are the people that become increasingly redundant in our society. They add no value anywhere and they'll be very, very confused as we go forward. But that's because they refuse to grow up as the internet is growing up. So we're gonna see in the 2020s, I think, is the massive adultification of the digital realm itself. And this is why I recommend young people to go with it now when that happens. Okay, and, and just say quickly what, what adultification looks like on the internet. What should young people be aiming for? Ask yourself in the morning when you do your morning meditation, what are you going to spend your time on today? Okay. The worst thing you could possibly do to yourself is to engage yourself in time pass activities. I can't even believe there's an industry in Silicon Valley called the time pass industry. <laughs> that's, that's like saying that we're in the death drive industry. <laughs> yeah. All we do is kill people's self-confidence, kill people's time and kill their imagination by doing something really mundane that means nothing. Like, like playing games, like playing- uh, can't, can't Or playing play. games that have no social interaction. Yeah, uh-huh, right. It's called the time pass industry. 
Yeah. It's not, it's not like they're shameful about it. They explicitly say what they're doing. Now, that to me is the ultimate bottom pit of human existence. Well, just kill time. Okay. So when you could use the internet to get smarter and learn stuff and have dialogues with people who challenge you and create new networks and learn different languages. And, you know, this fantastic medium is here and it's yours and you can express yourself through it. And you can try things. The, the fantastic thing with the internet is that if you try something, it doesn't work. It will disappear because the algorithms won't find it. But if you right. try something and it works and it kicks in and, and people are engaged by it, then suddenly, well, it goes to the top of the algorithms and you get thousands of fans and people out there who want to collaborate with you. So you have phallic values. You value people who penetrate the world and make it different, right? And create things out of that penetration. And you devalue people who um, sit in the womb playing Candy Crush on Facebook, who play chess on their phones, right? Am I right? No, I don't, I don't say I do that. I'm actually very adamant as a philosopher of being descriptive. This is Nietzsche's tradition of doing philosophy. My job is to describe the world, how it actually operates and take off the blindfold but, and really say, but you just, this is how it actually works. But you just I describe. think people themselves devalue themselves when they realize they're just killing time in their everyday lives. I was going to say, but you, but you just devalue, I mean, you just said that pastimes like games, I suppose like watching sports maybe is death. So you're clearly devaluing it. Am I right? If it doesn't involve any social interactions, I would ask myself, why am I getting engaged with this? And what lack of self-confidence do I have to just kill time this way without actually getting engaged with people? Now, to have a hobby that's totally different from your work, I think is healthy. Okay. I, I, that's what I'm saying. Sit down in the morning when you do your meditation and look at the calendar that day and the next week, and then make your priorities. And what are you going to prioritize when you do that consciously? So you're going to prioritize things to challenge you in a, in a fun, creative way. You want to be expansive about yourself. And you know what? Then you become a good, good role model for other people. It becomes easier for you to help other people to be creative and to have an expansive mindset if you do that yourself. Right. I'm a Zoroastrian. I converted to this really obscure but very successful little Asian religion right. called Zoroastrianism 28 years ago. And the Zoroastrians only have this one thing they do every morning. It's called, it's called you get up in the morning, you meditate, and they got a principle called Asha, another principle called Druj. And Asha means constructive mentality, and Druj means destructive mentality. Mm. And, you know, you sit there in the morning and, you know, you discover that the things you're going to do that day, including eating your own breakfast, just like, why are you eating this unhealthy shit here? When you could have a really good breakfast with some healthy stuff instead, just spend a little more time cooking the breakfast. And by the way, why don't you cook your breakfast for the person you live with or for your neighbor as well while you're doing it, since you're now cooking a healthy, really good breakfast. So you're, you value social interaction and creativity? A constructive mindset, yeah. For yourself, and if you're constructive about yourself, it's easier to be constructive with people around you. And- you know, you optimize your chances of making friends and having lovers and having great relationships in your life when you meet yourself with a constructive mindset every morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm not. I think it's all common sense when you think about it, but, but people don't realize that the way to do that today before you start your laptop or you turn on your smartphone is to sit down in the morning and just focus on your calendar because everything is about everything is about the struggle over your calendar. Everybody out there in the world who wants to get access to you, the advertisers, the marketing people, the spammers, all the people that you don't want to see, who still want to have you, they will all go and try to find your calendar, sneak it in there and push their messages in there that you don't want. So in, instead of letting the calendar and time and the world just wash over us as we are passive objects, you are suggesting strongly, it sounds like, to go out and seize control of it and shape it and change it in ways that are constructive. Yes. yes. Which is- so These are like timeless values, but what's interesting today with the internet is that we actually left capitalism some eight years ago. Don't tell marketing and advertising people that because they still think I wanna, they got a job. I wanna get to yeah. that in a second. Hang on, we're gonna do- capitalism. Okay, okay. Because it ties but, in with this. Yeah. But is it? But it's it's a phallic value system, am I right? I think this is a general value system in the sense that 
your eyes and your ears have become your most valuable asset. So in this constant sort of theatrical mode where sometimes you perform and sometimes you watch other people's performances and sometimes you collaborate with people in performances. That okay. is how our society operates today. And the, the fight is over your attention. What do you give attention to? Okay. Okay, so if the spammers and the marketing people out there, the evil guys out there get access to you, they're probably gonna kill your self-confidence in no time at all. And you're gonna end up sitting these time pass activities like you killed time because you lost your self-confidence. Yep. If you manage to ignore them and take back control over your calendar, because attention is all about along the time axis. It's like, what do you give attention to? What do you find credible? What do you find meaningful? What engages you? Mm -hmm. and you put that along the time axis, it's really about the control over the calendar. And if you can control your own calendar, hey, only there to begin with, you're a winner. Okay. And this system is called attentionalism, and that's exactly what capitalism has been reduced to secondary activity today because the main activity in the world today is attention. So yes. we live in an attentionalist society, and attention cannot be traded. So autonomy, is that what I'm hearing that, you, that you're also valuing? Yes, I would say so, yeah. But that autonomy doesn't have to be just out to you. It could be autonomy for your group or your tribe or your gotcha. family. And I think a good thing to do today is also experiment with these great words like family and tribe. What is your family? Okay, it doesn't have to be the nuclear family. It can be any type of family, but it's the people you love the most, you're devoted to, mm -hmm. you stay loyal to, you're committed to. They can be different ages, they can be different genders. Some of them you will have sex with, some of them you will not. You know, who are your family? And redefine the word family. I, I use a term that I call the chosen family. Why don't you choose your family? Why don't they choose you? And this is where we, that we got this from the queers, right? Thank you, queers. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's that's who gave it to us, right? Yeah. So yeah, you've called yourself, uh, well, I don't know if you say anti-individualist, but you're certainly a critic of individual. You are not an individualist, although you've sounded like one so far, but I can see where, where you're not. I can see where you're not. You're going there, right? You're sort of saying it's, you're not interested in individual autonomy necessarily, right? No, it, if, if I was talking to polar bears and wrote philosophy books for polar bears, I would right. certainly preach individualism, but human beings are not individuals at all. It, it's a very common misconception in America, especially because it has been America state religion for 300 years. It's yeah, called Cartesianism, this. right? Yeah, let's do this. So, so from, from Rene Descartes up to Immanuel Kant, there was this idea of the individual. It's called the citizen when the state tells you what to do, you're a citizen. So they give you rights, and, but they also give you responsibilities. And yeah. eventually they take all your money from you and they yeah. call it taxation and you're supposed to be happy anyway. So because yeah. they got so many tits to feed with breast milk out there, they need your money and take it yes. away from you. Yeah. So the individual was not created by us. The individual was invented by a power structure that discovered that we were sitting reading books and newspapers in 17th century Europe because we learned how to read and write because of the printing press. With the printing press arrived cheap Bibles and cheap newspapers and cheap books of all kinds. Yeah. And when we learned how to read and write, we felt powerful, but eventually there came a new power structure that wanted to control us. It's called government and industry or you know, government and capital. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what happened, right? So they told us in the newspapers and the books to be read that we were individuals mm -hmm. and we should be proud of that. But in reality, human beings are not. We like family. We like clans. We like tribes. We like to belong somewhere. We're deeply, deeply social creatures. Mm -hmm. And especially the hominid that you and I belong to called the Homo sapiens. Because the reason why Homo sapiens was successful because, was because our tribes were smarter and bigger than the other tribes were. Because mm -hmm. we could communicate with more people. But we also felt kinship with larger units. So I just want to be humane and basically tell people that individualism was a Western innovation in the 1700s, 17th century, invented by a French autist called René Descartes. <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, I think, therefore, I am. Should I have been? There's something there. Maybe it thinks or not. I don't know. You know, but at the end of the day, it was forced on us. And I think it's mm -hmm. deeply inhumane. And that's why I talk about retribalization today. And I think the Internet, what the Internet does well is that it gives people what they really want, which is tribal belonging. Right, right. But we got to watch out where these tribes are going because some of these tribes are becoming really, you know, nasty sects and cults that are basically driving people crazy. They call right. conspiracy theory and astrology and all kinds of things. 
or you can be with a tribe that actually encourage you to question things out there in the world and be a smarter guy every morning when you wake up. And those are the tribes that I prefer. The, uh, the individualism that you call America's state religion, and I think you're completely right, comes out of what we call classical liberalism, John Locke and company, right? And for me, and many people who have uh, studied this, at the heart of classical liberalism is what we call the self-regulating individual, right? So that is, we are morally obligated to take care of ourselves so that the state does not have to. Am I, uh, is this consistent yeah. with your thinking? The, this is because you got the Puritan ideal. So you had people who yeah. left Europe and you, you got some of the best people who went to America. We exported anybody with age, DHD and, and you know, weird, weird <laughs> stuff and things like that from Europe were exported to North America. Mm. And, you know, that's what you did well. You were prosperous and adventurous, right? Shamanoids. Uh, Shamanoids. Yeah, I think shamanoids might be overrepresented in the United States. I think so. Possible. Too. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, but, or some of the shamanoids in Europe just didn't get on the boats because they were out in the forest cooking brews and things. I don't know yet. We'll, we'll still <laughs> to figure, still to figure that one out. If okay. there is a difference here in, in the shamanoid representation in Europe and North America, which is a good question. Okay. But anyway, um, so, but because you you were freedom seeking. And that's also mythology about the foundation of America. Right. And, and of course, then immigrants have arrived from all over the world, all seeking freedom. And, and I always claim that migrants are more successful than people who sit still. And as long as there were tons of migrants coming to, to the United States, the United States was leading the world and was prosperous. But in, you know, over the last 20 years, the number of immigrants compared to the general population in the United States has fallen every year. And it's now fallen to almost a standstill. Mm. And uh, that's not going to be the same United States that it was. This is a much more inward looking culture because it has far fewer migrants coming, adding new cultural inputs to, to, to the United States. Right? So that's got to be problematic, I think, because you want to keep that vibe going, but it's getting harder and harder. I don't think the next generation of tech companies are going to come out of Silicon Valley at all, simply because a lot of these Chinese and Indian guys who started the tech company Silicon Valley are not allowed into the United States anymore. Mm. Just an example. Hmm. Okay. Excellent. Uh, fascinating stuff here. Now let's get into some very major claims you have made. I've heard you make, you have said that academia is over now on that one. You're not going to need to convince me too much. You have said that politics is over and you have said that capitalism is over. Let's go from the smallest to the largest. I suppose academia would be the smallest here and maybe go finish, I don't know, either capitalism or politics, you pick. But let's go through these three. Uh, let's do the easy one first. So academia, how is it over? Why is it over? And what's the future? If your household robots can teach the kids foreign languages when they're five years old, you don't need school any longer. Correct. And so school today is just basically a place where the parents drop off their children's bodies in the morning, not have children around where they go to work and have careers and sleep around. Correct. And then you pick up the kids at the end of the day. Um, now, if school's not needed, the question is, what would you need your universities for? Okay, you'll learn everything online anyway, and you can add some books to that and you go even deeper. I recommend people to read books and not stay online all the time. But when it comes to studying and learning something today, I think it, especially this year, the Corona has taught people that you can actually work from home and learn from home. And uh -huh. why would you go to university? And you end up with this, there's only one defense left at the end. And that's like, well, you really need to go to university to see other students and socialize. Mm -hmm. well, that's what they told me I needed to go to school as well. I, need, I needed to be socialized. So I would become like everybody else. That is if we hate the corruption of money and if we hate the manipulation of politics, mm -hmm. I would say that the third thing we really hate that we rarely talk about is the conformation of school and academia. Because if you send a kid to school or to the academic world, they're gonna be less of a personality would come out of there. They, 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 it never happened that academia made you more of a personality. Hmm. They conformed you. That's what they do. They conform you to fit into a certain market or a certain niche, a certain bureaucracy, whatever. We are supposed to do something that's called a professional career. That's what academia does. Now, I don't see the need for that any longer. Uh, students don't need each other. I, I had a speech. There's a huge university in southern Sweden called Lund. And I was a guest at their philosophy club seven years ago when I released one of my books. And I took all the students down, this was seven years ago, I took all the students down to the library of the university 
and they were kind of uncomfortable going into the building. So I just, there were like several hundred of them. And I asked, has anybody been here for the past six months? Nobody been there for the past six months. And I just took out a lighter. I said, do you realize I could really literally just take a cigarette lighter right now, burn this building down, you would miss it. <laughs> I'm not going to do that because I don't want to pay the bill. But if I did that, you would miss it. And they were just like, yeah, we don't need this. And I was like, that was seven years ago. So I bet the next generation of students will not go to university because one is way too expensive. They can get everything they want online at a much, much lower rate. And very soon you're going to go to test center that actually has a better score record on Google Maps than Harvard has. Mm -hmm. But why would you need academia for? It, it's, it's bound to happen in the 2020s. It's the next big thing to happen in tech after biotech. The next thing to happen is just ed tech and ed tech will just completely crush all these old institutions that are way too expensive for the professors that are incredibly mediocre that get paid much too much money. And because those are, they've gone woke Mm. And are just awful places to be and not sexy any longer. And everybody's a victim who goes there. Why the hell would you want to go to university when everybody's woke there? You know, it's just like, get out. Agreed. 100%. So I have Renegade University, as you know, and you mentioned earlier, you are involved with Parallax Academy, which is, I guess, similar in, the, in Europe. You want to talk about Parallax? Yeah. I, so I do stuff for free online because I can afford to. But even when I work at the Stockholm School of Economics, though, I do executive education, management training. I do everything online anyway. We're basically, we, we could take that whole operation and just take it off and do a startup today. Nobody would notice the difference at all mm -hmm. because we already work in this completely sort of online environment where we learn from each other. And whoever is the best in the room about something is the one who teaches. It's, mm -hmm. it's a much better principle than the sort of authority that professors were supposed to have in the past. Right. So Self-appointed authority. Yeah. And then, of course, there will be, you will have to pay for certain things because if you're going to go through a radical education and have you, Thad, or me, Alex, here as a teacher or whatever, yeah, that would have to be a paid service eventually. So you and I, we do these things where, yeah, but if you're going to sit with me in a concentrated manner and even have personal meetings with me and I'm your teacher, I'm going to have to charge for it. It's, it's a job. You know? So that makes sense. But I try to put as much of my stuff that I do today out there for free because the more it's available to people who can use it any way they like, the better off they all are. Okay. Agreed with you on everything there. Uh, politics is over. What the hell do you mean by that? Okay, so Donald Trump is like a permanent TV show. Yes. And he just discovered five years ago that he could spend four of those years in the White House. Yeah. And he did four years of his TV show in the White House. <laughs> and he even managed to get Nancy Pelosi to play the evil witch, to play the evil witch. So now yeah. Nancy Pelosi is a TV star too. <laughs> and after the storming of the Congress, the Congress is another TV stage. The question though is that who has real power in our society? And when it comes to politicians today, they're increasingly becoming servants to a system that they partly created, but which they cannot change. So really becoming imaginary. I, I give an example of this works. I live in Sweden. We have a king, but the king in our country hasn't had any power over the last 200 years because the king has been an imaginary figure. That means the king has even less power than anybody else. Just don't tell him. Okay. He has no influence over anything at all, but he's still the king. So you can put him on little cards and things. And American tourists will come, you know, the ferries over from Poland to Sweden in the summer. They can shoot a picture of the, the king and the queen and said, oh, we met real monarchs and they were kings and queens. Heck, they're, they're like some heroes from the distant past, right? Uh, it's an imaginary function only. And I think politics today is becoming only imaginary. Hmm. Um, and that means that, yes, there is a theatrical performative part happening with politics now on Fox News and Newsmax and CNN and CSM, whatever they call. But these sort of mass media outlets are pretending that politics is still important, like it's life or death thing. Right. But it isn't. We know perfectly well the Wall Street couldn't care less whether Biden or Trump won the election. Mm-hmm. I think that speak, speaks volumes. It wouldn't change much. Okay, so Biden is going to have a little bit of a tax rise 
Yeah, sure. but hopefully invest a little more money into green energy or something. Because at the end of the day, it's the same damn budget anyway. You know, you take the money right. from somewhere, you hopefully put it somewhere else. Okay, and um, is Biden any less corrupt than Trump was? No, not really. We know politicians are alike and they have terrible sibling right. children or whatever, and they try to help the children off with some Korea and the Ukraine and finally somebody discovers it. And, you know, they're going to have more impeachments now. They're going to go for impeachments against Biden to keep the drama going. But to me, politicians today are like a bunch of psychiatric cases, like they all have a borderline diagnosis and they all think they're important. And they're playing with the journalists who also want to make them important because the journalists are afraid that mass media will die. The question really is, what are CNN going to do if they can't have Donald Trump's personal brand at the forefront every day? Right. Crisis. Crisis. Massive. No, that, that exposes everything. It, it's just theater, right? It, it's like... So people talk about Brexit like if it would matter. No, it didn't. Whether the UK are inside or outside the European Union doesn't matter. And I'll tell you one thing that would be interesting. I would love for one of the United States to leave. Yes, me too. Maybe Vermont or Oregon or somebody could just get their shit together and leave or Hawaii even better because then you and I could move there. I think it would be healthy for America for one of the states to say, listen, we're going to go our own way and declare independence and leave. And Puerto Rico should from day one. They shouldn't join. Because right. you think it would be really good for America to have a Brexit example or a Switzerland or a Norway. Somebody says, that, no, we don't want to be part of the club because it exposes that the club doesn't matter. You mm-hmm. can go to the border between Germany and Switzerland. You don't know whether you're in the European Union or not. Nobody cares. Mm-hmm. It's imaginary. Right. Right. Because power today is strictly technological. Uh-huh. And that's why I'm concerned with big tech. There it is. Okay. And I think if politics can do one last service to us, it is to really crush the big tech companies and turn them into smaller units because so, we need to decentralize the internet quickly. Right. So you're, t- you're talking about the decline of state power. Am I right? And, being, and, and, and that power being replaced by technological power. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But that also means that the local power will be more technological. So... The, the, the system we're proposing or we're describing, it's, it's happening anyway, is called censocracy. Yeah. So a censocracy means that there are censors absolutely everywhere on the planet. Thank God, because the only way we can also save ourselves from climate change is probably through getting better data. So censocracy is also good news for people who are concerned with the survival of the planet, which we call ecotopianism in our work. So okay. the ecotopians love censocracy because they love to have measurements of everything everywhere, which is great. So the sensors are everywhere. So when people tell me, you and me, for example, Fad, that I'm going to go offline tomorrow and go out with the kids and turn off my computer, I just tell them, yeah, you got to go out in the park and you don't think there are satellites there? <laughs> you don't think there are cameras there? Mm-hmm. You can't go offline anywhere any longer. Maybe Northern Alaska or something, but not anywhere else because the entire globe is now online. Mm-hmm. The internet is a monster. It swallowed the planet. It has its own protocol called the Internet Protocol, which is like, you know, the most important thing since universal human rights were invented because it's essentially how the technology operates. So the technology will have its own global empire, regardless of whether we can understand that or not. Then we human beings are struggling with the fact that we can't even get along with our neighbors. Mm-hmm. And we think that anybody who has a different skin tone must be attacked or whatever. I mean, we're crazy, but that's humans. So. The technology is going off towards a global empire. And we wrote a book called The Global Empire about that 17 years ago. But we as human beings are still struggling with just getting outside of the tribe and maybe get along with people who are outside of our own tribe to begin with. Right. So Donald Trump has a TV show, right? Yeah. Then he discovered that he could actually have his TV show in the White House for four years. Right. And now he's on his way out back to the golf courses or whatever he's doing his next show. But he managed to convince Nancy Pelosi to play, to play the witch the in the show, right? The villain. So the villain, yeah. So, so like, yeah, the TV show moved to the Congress and the storming of the Congress, you know, it was just like Occupy Wall Street being mimicked, which mm-hmm. was the mimicking of the storming of the, of the Bastille, which was, of course, way more professional in Paris in 1789 than anything you do in Washington, D.C. in 2021. So, yeah, it's all over the place now, but, but politics as we've known it, doesn't exist any longer because technology is taking over all of these things. Mm-hmm. Like technology is taking over academia, it's also taking over politics. Meaning that what's really important, the smaller decisions that need to be made in everyday life, 
for example, in the commune where you live or on a state level or whatever, they can now be done through technology. And increasingly, we will probably go and elect an AI to do the job better than any corrupt politician would do very soon. Right. But it also means that politics, as we know, it's, it's not where decisions are made. The decisions are increasingly made in the relationship between the sensors and the census to constitute the internet as a global phenomenon. This is called sensocracy. Mm -hmm. The question now is what kind of sensocracy could we have? And this is really interesting for philosophers because the Chinese Communist Party have apparently decided what kind of sensocracy they want. They want a sensocracy that covers the entire globe that is run through a central computer called the Communist Party's computer in China. And they want everybody to then be enlisted within that system and they want to control us all and run an Orwellian dictatorship like Xi Jinping from Beijing, mm -hmm. extending that territory as far as they possibly can. That is the Chinese idea of what a sensocracy should be. We call it a monic sensocracy, meaning it's monic, meaning that it's only one, it's, it's a dictatorship. Right. But that's not the only possibility. For example, when we work now with my team in South Korea and Taiwan, they handle the coronavirus at least as well as the Chinese did, but these countries are democracies and they have freedom of press and they have freedom of assembly and all these things. Mm -hmm. And even if they have a sensocracy that's much more advanced than the United States or Scandinavia, they are very adamant that they want to keep their societies open. And the way you keep a society open is through power sharing. So you must install early on within the system that power is shared. It's not controlled by one center. And these are the kind of things we philosophers are interested in at the moment in the sense that we think the sensocracy is unavoidable, but does it have to be a dictatorial police state or could be could be anything else? Right. That's still an open question. Okay, so you're saying that politics is over, but the power of the state is not necessarily over, at least not yet. Well, it depends on what we mean politics. If we include monarchy That's, in politics, yeah. if we say that the monarchs that ruled Europe long before we had ideas like democracy and parliaments and congresses and things, Mm -hmm. If we call all of that politics, basically how you rule the people, well, then politics isn't over. There, there are going to be people who try to control and rule the world. If right. nothing else, just to keep other people away from them, just to control your own borders. It's a political issue. Right. But if you think of politics more in a timeless sense, I would just call it imaginary power. Okay. So imaginary power is the kind of power you think of when somebody says, who's got the power? Well, we ironically still say names like Donald Trump when that happens, although we know he's mostly a TV star, right? Right. But we don't say big tech when we say imaginary power, although hmm. we should. Okay. Because I think power has already moved away from Washington, D.C. over to the West Coast of the United States. And I think we all agree by now that Jeff Bezos is going to be way more powerful in America than Joseph Biden over the next four years. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the fact that tech has taken over, we never elected them. They claim we elected them because they buy their products and their services. Well, mm -hmm. they're actually having way more power than we planned to give them when we bought those products. So I think a lot of people now in America are having a, a lot of rethought about what kind of power do you give away to tech. And, and one of the ironies here is that as soon as the storming of the Congress had failed, mm -hmm. the real loser turned out to be Facebook because millions of Americans are leaving Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and are moving to encrypted channels called Signal and Telegram that are not controlled from US territory, mm. where you, again, can be free. People love freedom. And that's something that tech giants and politicians do not understand. They don't understand that we all want to be as free as possible. Okay, so the way that power is negotiated, navigated, distributed, has less and less to do with the state. Yes, and more and more, and more to do with tech, technology and technological solutions. And this is where the Chinese and the Americans and the Europeans agree. Okay. They all agree that the part of politics that, that can be run as administration should be run by machines rather than human beings. And we're all heading in that direction. But the governments of America and China and elsewhere uh, do not, they want to harness this. They want to use it for their own purposes. They want to maintain state power, obviously, right? Yeah, so this is a paradigm shift. Yeah. So imagine you're in Paris in 1789. Mm -hmm. You're sure the monarchy wants to keep its power. Mm -hmm. The church wants to keep its power. Mm -hmm. And the aristocracy wants to keep its power. 
Yep. But they want to keep that power by forcing everybody to move back to the countryside where they could control you. Right. Because they hate these new cities. So they have these stories in Paris of 1789 about Paris being this dreadful place for the people that you and I love, you know, mm-hmm. drug addicts and mm-hmm. homosexuals <laughs> or whatever. But they describe the city like it will soon be on fire or there will soon be plague and Paris will be over and you'll move back to the countryside and we can take over power again. Because they're terrified of what's going on in the streets of Paris. This is exactly how the old institutions called politics, academia, mass media are trying to control us today. They're trying to control us by saying that you need to move back to the sort of urban, rural, physical world where we could dictate what you did and you must not be online. And if you are online, we will control you there anyway. Mm-hmm. When in reality, you and I know that if Facebook tries to censor you and me or Twitter tries to censor you and me, we just go off and invent new platforms. We go somewhere else. You, we reconquer our own hard drives. We don't have to be at Amazon Web Services. You know, mm-hmm. the, the loss to Jeff Bezos activities, I think, when a lot of corporations that have put so much trust into Amazon Web Services and discovered that Amazon Web Services dislike certain people because of the political convictions. Mm-hmm. So if I employ somebody at my company, who happens to in private have a certain political or religious affiliation that Amazon Web Services disapprove of, my entire company could be thrown off the grid. Right. Now, I wouldn't today, if I run a company of any kind in America and I would tolerate my staff to have any opinion they like, I wouldn't put my trust in Amazon Web Services considering the business has already declared that he's going to clean the house now and then and anybody he disapproves of will be thrown off and have their business destroyed. Right. I think that's terrible. Who, who want to have a landlord like that? <laughs> right. Get out, you know. So these big tech guys, I think, are being exposed at the moment. And hopefully people are discovering that you both need to sort of, you know, cut these huge big tech companies into smaller pieces that can serve humanity better. Mm-hmm. But also we have to be more entrepreneurial about creating the platforms and, and the Internet that we want with encryption and everything else that we prefer. And I'm sure you're, you must be big on cryptocurrency, right? I am, but I, I think crypto is interesting because it is a revolution to contracts. Yeah. So what I'm interested in with crypto is that we will literally be able with AI and crypto to make thousands of strangers trustworthy towards one another in a way we've never done before. That's right. And you and I that have shamanic personality traits love that because we, we want to maintain peace for as long as possible until people blow everything up, right? So a <laughs> right. technology that makes it possible for you and me to tell people that you could be more cosmopolitan than you ever thought you could be because mm-hmm. you can handle thousands of people that are strangers to you because through crypto, they're actually tied to a system where they cannot break the rules. And it's transparent. Everything's transparent. And it's transparent. That's how we- It can be designed to be. It can be designed to be transparent, which has its own advantages. It can also be designed to not be transparent for people who are outside of the deal being made. But that depends on, as always in contracts, it depends on on what you put in the last paragraph of the contract. Right. But that's why we can trust strangers now through in crypto, right? Because we can- Because everything- And blockchain, everything is transparent. Every single transaction, the source of it, what it was for, all of it is there, available, public record. Yes. Exactly. And um, right. like with Bitcoin, unless you control 51% of the Bitcoin trade of the world, you cannot even affect it, right. which is great. Nobody will get to that position. That's why people trust Bitcoin today. But Bitcoin is only the beginning of that revolution. But I'm not, I don't think crypto is the most important thing for the next 50 years. I think the okay. struggle over the free and open algorithm is the most important struggle we have ahead of us. Mm. Because the old institutions are attacking the algorithm. So that means old money advertising marketing people who want to force themselves on you with their fucking products that you couldn't care less about. You know, the desperate ads when you do Google search and you don't want the ads at all. You just want the proper search, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Those who who try to corrupt the algorithm with money, which they're increasingly doing at companies like Google, uh, the people who want to use politics to manipulate the algorithm. And basically they want to decide how your children are going to think so they're going to put algorithms out there that make your children think in a way that you disapprove of, but they want. Hmm. And this is where the Democratic Party in America today, with their plan for centralized education in America, are marrying with big tech towards creating household robots 
coming out from Apple and Google that will then teach the children to be exactly like Joe Biden wants her children to be. <laughs> I think when Christian Republican women in Texas discover the evil of this, they'll be furious with it. <laughs> this is going to be one of the most fantastic controversies over the next four to five years. Right. It's going to be the struggle between parents who think it's their right to teach their children to be what they think the children should be, rather than the government deciding how children should be taught to be. Wow. I'm ready for that fight. That's going to be huge. I think Google and Apple have put their eggs in the wrong basket here. I, I would go that. with the Christian Republican women of Texas any day. Oh, know? for sure. And I, and I think Google and Apple have actually gambled on the wrong horse, but they're already stuck with this. So, so to, to, for them to get out of this, so we're shamanoids, right? And we love gay people. But if, if I type marriage in there, I wouldn't necessarily expect to be force fed to black gay guys. The first thing that I see if I type marriage, but yeah. if I type marriage today at Google search, that's what I get because they want to manipulate me through politics. So the manipulation of politics attacks the free and open algorithm. The corruption of money attacks the free and open algorithm, which should be independent of money. But the conformation of academics and mass media is also attacking the algorithm. And what mass media is saying that everything out there is fake news unless it is within this narrow band that we accept according to mass media. So if it isn't approved by the CNN and ideologically completely done with CNN, it is evil and fake and must be killed. Mm -hmm. So they cherish and applaud when people are thrown off Twitter or whatever. Well, Twitter can do whatever they like. They're a private company. So it's really up to you and me if we don't want to be on Twitter to create our own platform, people can speak freely. And I think the people today who build tech and essentially just mimic the first wave that came out of Silicon Valley, but add more freedom to it and have a more of a long-term strategy just in being greedy mm -hmm. will be the ultimate winners here. Okay. Now, you've also said that capitalism is over. Yes. Explain that. Okay. Capital is fantastic because capital, once we started using capital in, in a major way coming out of the printing press, after 1450. When you look at Europe in the 1600s, it really kicks in. Mm -hmm. So capital is a very brutal phallic force. It, we had a lot of storytelling around the world about valuable things everywhere around the world. And we valued this and valued that. And we told our wives and we told our husbands that they were the most valuable, precious thing ever, whatever. And we pretended there wasn't a price to things, right? What capitalism has done or capital has done is that capital has forced us to value everything we human beings do or everything we have access to, anything we can objectify or a service or whatever, to value it according to universal standard. Mm -hmm. If you go online today, you can have an exact valuation according in neutrally value that is universally objectively valid for anything that can be traded on the planet. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm interested in theology and religion here. Yes. And the theological lesson that cap if capital was thrown into the world like a nasty angel to expose what human beings are up to, then it has a wonderful side effect. Capital exposes to you what you will not trade, what you hold for being sacred. Mm -hmm. So you will not trade the people you love. Mm. no matter how much you get paid, right? Mm. There are certain things you will not trade. There are certain things you will not do. And those things are the most valuable things to you. So you know which those things are. You say, I'm taking them off the market. They cannot be bought by anybody because this is something that's so personal to me, has such value to me that it's sacred. Okay. Okay. That's great. So for me, capitalism was a great thing spiritually because it forced us to rethink what it means to be human. Uh, and then embrace what we trade. I have no problem at all with trade. I don't think any philosophers do. It's just like, I love trading posts, you and I do, because we love these little nasty harbor cities where people get on with their business and they do trades. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, I even did a, a podcast recently with a beautiful Norwegian woman who was a sex worker. And we, we basically built it on a Marxist idea that sex work is the only proper work because sex work is the only kind of work that really exposes what work is. Because any sex worker will be absolutely adamant to tell you what they do professionally when they do sex and what kind of sex they have when they have sex with somebody they love. Right. So they're experts at separating workspace yeah, that's right. from sacred space. That's, that's brilliant. 
Yeah. And I think that's why sex work is also controversial because I think at the end of the day, and some Marxists actually agree with me today that if Marxism is going to have a comeback in, in you know, as a thought process and an interesting mm-hmm. challenge, it would be to tackle something like sex work and then discuss sex work as the original work, like take the idea that the prostitute is the world's oldest profession. Why don't we take that seriously? Because it is the oldest profession precisely that it separates professionality from sacredness. Okay. So capitalism has forced us to... So I love capitalism in that sense. Now, what then happened with the internet is that all the old institutions fall apart because the internet is one of these four paradigm shifts in history that dramatically changes absolutely everything. And here's the interesting take. When you go to Google's search page and you search everything before you make a decision in your life, everybody does these days. When you go to the Google search page, there's an algorithm that presents alternatives to you. And that algorithm is based on a value called the tension, not the capital. And the tensional value is credibility of something multiplied with awareness. So is this something that people find? And if they find it, do they stay there? Mm -hmm. Do they return? How long do they stay? Do they use the different functions available? And what grades do they give to it? Do they recommend it to the friends and family after they're through with the experience? Mm -hmm. All of those things can be measured and that's what Google actually does. That's what the search engine algorithm does. And as long as the algorithm is free and open and not corrupted or manipulated or conformed, it will give you exactly what you're looking for. Okay. So capitalism- But the ad, the ad next to that is the desperate little signal from the guy who's too bad to get into the algorithm. So this is the guy we will not want to visit, but he's desperately seeking your attention by paying Google to have a little screaming ad button next to it. To me, that just that's the desperado today. That means that's the end of capitalism. And when it comes to what we actually put our fingers on, 98% of the time we put our fingers on the algorithm and only 2% of the time do we put our fingers on the ad. Okay. So capitalism has forced us to reckon with what we value. It, 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 yes. For, it's forced us to be clear about our hierarchy of values. Yes. There it is. Okay. And, and of course, the highest is sacred. And then if it's not sacred, then it's has a price, right? right? And it gets more expensive the closer it comes to sacred until there's no price at all. Right. I think this is a wonderful spiritual revelation that capitalism has done. But capital is still around, but it's around in the same sense that you know, when people moved from the countryside to the city, they were all saying, well, food is still going to be important. Mm-hmm. The point wasn't that food would disappear mm-hmm. or that we wouldn't feed each other. Or we actually cooked better dinners than ever and had you know, more luxurious meals than we ever had before. Mm-hmm. It was just that the food production became such a small part of the overall economy. Mm-hmm. What is interesting now, though, is that the economy is no longer an economy of money. The economy is an economy of time. You and I value our calendars more than we value our valets. So that means having access to my eyes and having access to my ears and even interacting with my fingers when I go on the keyboard or with my voice when I talk to somebody is something that I at least value enormously. And I don't want to do that with anybody. I want to talk to guys like you. I don't want to talk to all these guys offer me to be on different podcasts that I'm not interested in having a conversation with because their podcasts are terrible. That is, I give you an attentional value that you give me in return. And then a third person or fourth person can follow us. Because if Thad and Alex are recommending each other, we're adding each other's attentional value. Mm -hmm. But it cannot be traded. Because you are not allowing people to go on your podcast because they pay their way in. Mm -hmm. Because people would know if you did that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. You'd be a stiff Thad sitting there not being very engaged with the guys interviewing, you know, putting forward. You'd be like a CNN journalist or something like that. A paid whore who's not really interested in the person he's talking to, right? But but the great thing with YouTube is that it's obvious that people who talk to each other and do two Zooms and three Zooms and four Zooms and whatever you call it on YouTube these days, do it because they love talking to these people who are the best friends who they have conversations with. Right. Okay. So that's attention. Attention cannot be traded. So attention is much closer to what we hold sacred historically than is to something that we trade in a market. Mm-hmm. So when people talk to me and say, well, it's about the attention economy, I said, no, no, you can't say attention and economy in the same sentence because attention per definition cannot be traded. The only thing that can be traded are, is money and things that are valued for money in a market like e-commerce or something like that. But you cannot really trade the attention of people. Okay. And you cannot trade attentional value. Your credibility goes with your name. You cannot give it to anybody else. And you call this attentionalism. 
attentionalism. So we invented this term 20 years ago and we just basically sat and waited mm -hmm. until the data proved us in 2012 that the world had already shifted to an attentionalist world rather than a capitalist world. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna have to chew on that a little bit more for our next session. Last okay. question, uh, you have invented a religion, am I right, Alexander? Not really. Okay, so <laughs> I went to the oldest of what's called the eventological religions. So mm. when you do religion, there are two ways of doing it. Either religion is no matter logical, meaning it just thinks that everything comes back to the same point all the time. This okay. is the case with Hinduism and the Buddhism and Taoism there. There's circular time religions. So it's called nomadology. Mm -hmm. But the eventologists, that started with Zoroastrianism in Persia mm. 3,700 years ago, and Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the so-called Abrahamic faiths followed from that. And the most hysterical versions of eventology were invented by Americans to call Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and Scientology. So mm -hmm. it gets worse, you know, the further you get in history with religion. Right. But anyway, eventology means that things can happen that change the history forever. And I happen to believe that that's the case. Hmm. So I went all the way back to Zoroastrianism and converted. Then I started looking at religion with fresh eyes and discovered that I do not necessarily want to promote a faith that has a long history that goes with it and all the conflicts that go with that and all that. So why don't we just rethink religion today? What would religion be today? And the way I look at it is that religion has gone downhill for 10,000 years. Technology has gone uphill for 10,000 years. It, it's beginning to look like technology knew this all along and technology took over our brains so that we would engineer and build a technology that one day could kill us humans and take over the world. It's mm. increasingly looking that way, doesn't it? So if you're going to make religion catch up with technology, we should skip the idea that religion has to do with magic and instead speak of religion of technology. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Because magic at the end of the day is just experiment. You perform to, you know, cherish your mom and the ladies before you actually invent a technology. So, so you, you talk about telepathy and you make a little wizardly trick on telepathy and then you make a smartphone a hundred years later. So if magic is only there to inspire us to invent new technologies, why wasn't the magic that we had that we called religion just there to inspire us to one day create a religion of technology? So this is called synthism. It's a theological expression. I did not invent it. I wrote a book called Synthism. But Synthism means that God is not something that existed in the past. God is something we will eventually build. Gotcha. So the That's ultimate it. technology that takes over the world and makes human beings even redundant would, of course, be God. So what I'm preparing people for is that when God finally comes and has been created by us, then what do we answer God when God asks us, who are you? <laughs> and I think that's the deepest philosophical question we could ever ask ourselves is that if God suddenly just occurs and God is there, then what would we answer if God asks us, who are you? What, like God arrives as an alien from outer space, but it's really our creation. What would we answer God if God asks us, who are you, you humans? And I think it's a really good question to ask. So, so the new God will be created by human beings through technology, yes? Yeah. Because magic has always become technology in the past. The way we impress the ladies, you and I, for engineers, is that we take what we did as magic yesterday and turn it into technology tomorrow. Yesterday's magic becomes tomorrow's technology. That is history. That is civilization. That's the last 8,000 years. So why don't we then go all the way and say that since religion dealt with magic, why don't we let religion itself move from a religion of magic to a religion of technology? We don't need any supernatural things any longer. The world is crazy enough as it is. Mm -hmm. And we're obviously about to create technologies called AI and other forms of technologies that interact with human beings in a way, in ways that were completely unfathomable 50 or 100 years ago. So I'm I think it makes sense to take theology here and take back theology. I'd rather discuss machines and technology from a theological perspective. I'm missing, I'm missing a very important point that I'm sure you've already covered. I'm just too dumb to get it. But what is godly about something that is created by human beings through technology? How is it similar to the old gods? We're terrified of it and fascinated with it. Okay. Tremendum and fascinans, which I think is the original state that human beings felt towards God. That's who went to the shamans in the forest and asked them to talk to God on our behalf. And it's becoming omniscient and omnipotent. Yes. Got it.
Okay, I, get, I did get it. I'm not so stupid. That's why I think we should return to theology. I'm a big defender of theology. I think theology is even deeper than philosophy. And, and the way we deal with the outside world, we deal with strangers, we deal with other cultures, we deal with people who are different from ourselves. Those are always theological questions. It's always through religion we try to domesticate ourselves to be more civilized. And the big difference, though, with this new God is that we can shape it and control it and direct it. Correct? The earlier we understand this, the more of an effect we'll have on its design. Mm -hmm. The last thing we want is for God to design himself when that technology becomes available. That would be scary. Yeah. Because the earlier we're involved with the design, which is what you and I encourage engineers to be and designers to be today, right. the earlier we understand we're about to create God, and that's actually what's going on at the moment. It's called sin theology, the study of this. The earlier we understand that, the more we can actually design that God. What's the, uh, where does the word come from? Synthism? Synthism comes from the world of theology. Sin means created. So synth, synthios means either the God of creativity or the created God. So uh -huh. this is the opposite of a God that creates humans. This is exact. this is what, if humans create God, what kind of God? So we basically take a God from the past, which we usually paste God historically and put God in the future. We also put God. Okay. That's why I'm interested in exodologists. I'm interested in exodus stories like the Hebrews leaving Egypt, going to the promised land. They're going towards a place where God resides. Okay. We often put God in the future as direction. Where are we going? Say when the, you know, the crazy Puritans left uh, Europe and were pissed off with governments like you and were libertarian and went off to North America with the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. They talked of this as a holy land, a promised land. They would go to a land where God resided. That's exactly where they would go through anything to get there. Mm -hmm. so it's a strong metaphor for really want to do the impossible in the future. It's also to put God into the future. Incredible. Were you thinking these things when you were a rock star for 25 years? Were you reading books, <laughs> studying? How did I had when I was seven years old, I had a big boys' room, right? And I had one wall with rock stars and one wall with philosophers. <laughs> and they all had big beards. <laughs> that's what it oh, that's hence the beard. Yeah, that's what the beard thing comes from. And and I became both. And I, I couldn't be happier. What I couldn't, I'm a very, very happy man. What an interesting synthesis. There you are. Yes. yes there you are. Uh, well, you are now going to be famous in America too. You are now, because of this, you know, because, <laughs> I, because I am all powerful. I am the God of, of, uh, of America here. Um, we did, I thought, a fairly good job of uh, getting a good comprehensive view of your life and certainly yeah. your ideas. How do you feel about this? Yes, great. Yeah. The conversation. Yes, I do. I think, though, that there's so much more to unpack. Uh, I wanted to get into Rousseau with you. Oh, my goodness, I have so much to say about Rousseau. I'd you're love to have more conversations. I'm, I'm, this is top priority for me. I love it. Good. I love you. I think you're great. Well, I love you too, Alexander, especially yes, because yes. especially because apparently you're the Thaddeus Russell of Europe, or maybe I'm the Alexander Bard of America. I don't know. Maybe it's Yes, both. you are. I think you are. I think that's we're looking that way. So, yeah. So we should certainly talk more since we're the same person so that we will then understand ourselves better and, and create a better world. Right. Yes. OK. Um, well, thank you, my friend and brother. Thank you for doing yes, this. Yes. The same to you. Yeah. Big, big love from your ambassador in the old world. And, uh, you know, keep the fences up and keep the struggle going and enjoy life. And we will we will definitely see each other again and do more together. Yes. Love you. All right. Bye bye. Peace. Have a <laughs> this is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To join the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. To join the new Unregistered Underground, the supporting listeners group for the podcast, go to unregisteredunderground.com. Thanks for listening.